Good evening, everybody. All right, five of you, one of me. You're going to be nice. To each other or you? <laughs> nice to you, yes. Okay, this is nice so that's how I have a plan. Okay, great. So let's stick with this five thing for a second. Five words, what do each of you do? You each get five words, not in five words, one word. What do you do in five words? We each get five words for what we do. That's correct. But it's not a sentence, it's just five words. It can be a sentence, it can be five words. Oh, I'll just give you five words. News, politics, jokes, Trump, <laughs> fun. That's my five words. You guys are screwed. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, news? Oh, can we use the same ones? No, no, no. Oh, completely different. Okay. I mean, um, I can't really this keep is track five of words them. about what we do. It's about what you do. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I'd like uh, everyone to know what each of you five do. Oh. Problem solving. <laughs> Sometimes. Always. <laughs> Trump. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I heard you do, so that's perfect. Okay. Uh. Keep that shit together every day. <laughs> yes. Every day. Um, five unrelated words just randomly put together would be uh, help, help, Trevor hits me. <laughs> unrelated. Hey, that would say that. Um, I do the social media. <laughs> That's pretty much Good. it. That actually summarizes what they all do. I've been studying this for like five weeks and they just summarize that real quick for you. So I came to watch the show a couple weeks ago. I came to a taping, got to see your offices. You have a lot of dogs at the office. That's a thing. There. We have a dog friendly office, which I inherited from John Stewart. And uh, Jen Flans is basically, I feel like the, the arbiter of all dogs. Uh, she's not just the executive producer, but also the dog wrangler. And so when I came to the office the first time, I thought maybe it was like a dog episode. Um, and then I came back and I was like, wow, this is a long episode. <laughs> and then I found out, no, it's a dog-friendly office. And Jen actually thought when I joined, I was going to kick out all the dogs. I said, sure, fire away to have everyone on the staff turn against you, take away the dogs. Well, she thought that because you said, I'm going to kick out all the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I, people asked me, they said, do you, do you love dogs? And then I said like your dogs and then they were like yeah and I was like no because I don't know them I don't just love random dogs and I think they took that to mean that I would get rid of them and anyone who's read your book knows about yes that I love I love dogs, dogs so. so so the dogs have all stayed at the show it is a dog office I shouldn't have derailed the conversation on the dogs it seems but so one of the things I I was shocked about at the show is that you guys do a lot a live to tape daily show. I had forgotten that there was this taped show that runs on TV every night because I see it on Twitter, I watch on YouTube, I follow you on Instagram. Do you guys think of the show still as a TV show? I like to think of the show as having a home base on TV because there are still many people who say to me, hey, I DVR the show. I watch it in the morning when I get ready for work. Uh, I watch it at night. Sometimes people record the entire week on Comedy Central and then they binge watch the entire thing. So what I've always loved is thinking of the home of the show on TV. Um, but what has become wonderful is the news cycle truly has now become 24 hours, it feels like, you know? It feels like before it wasn't, like just people making it up, trying to fill time, but um, there was a change at a very high level in this country, and that really impacted when news uh, <laughs> broke. And so I, I think go it's, on, it's given on. us an opportunity to, to engage with the news in a different way. So now The Daily Show doesn't just live in one space, because news doesn't live in one space. You know, it, you, before The Daily Show mainly did TV because that's where news was happening, but then you get to a place where the president is basically holding press conferences on Twitter. You know, if he's engaging in foreign policy with foreign leaders on Twitter, tweeting them back and forth, then it feels only natural that you would then do the same thing with the show, is how do you adapt that commentary? You know, and then politicians are making Instagram videos showing you how natural they are. And so we figured, well, we could jump onto those platforms and comment it on, uh, on, on it in that way. And so we had to create a completely new division of The Daily Show that remain heads, that moves us in a, in, a, in, a, in a parallel direction. We're doing the same thing. The two are informing each other, but we have to give it as much attention as, as if it were its own thing. And Ramin, I love, tell us the name of the team you run, because it's 
Oh, not uh, the social media. No, we call it digital expansion because, as Trevor said, like we're expanding upon the linear version of the show, and often like we're doing jokes that you can't do um, on the show. You know, like we created a whole presidential Twitter library for Donald Trump, and it's it's an actual space. You walk into it, yeah. it looks and feels like a presidential library, um, but it's a satirical version of that. We can and actually. It's just like a, a different way to. Got it a different way to do um, a joke that we couldn't do on the show. Um, so that's what kind of that, that expansion entails. That's actually one of the best things about um, having the show be in all these different formats is that every format uh, has its own style of joke making, like Twitter, um, uh, Instagram videos, and we can make jokes that that work in those formats. We're not just putting up uh, clips of our show onto uh, Twitter in a way that doesn't make sense for the format. But one thing I think Ramin especially is like really good at is, is, is getting down to what exactly works in each of the many different formats we do jokes in and then making them unique to them. So it doesn't just feel like we're this old man coming into a format being like, ah, how about this fleek? And everyone's just kind of <laughs> says, what's going on? Which is my catchphrase in the office, just by the way. <laughs> What is this fleek? <laughs> Jen, you've been with the show um, for how long? 20 years? 21. 21 years. How, she was uh, born there. I think, yeah. And she drinks She's at work now. Been at the show longer than half this audience, it seems. And what, I mean, the expansion team is something somewhat new, but what, is, what do you think has been the biggest change in the production of the show in that time? Um, well, th that is a huge change because it's, like an immense amount of work that still goes into writing, producing, and we do it at the same level that we would do for the show. So it's, you know, I would say it's a third more work added to the day every day. Um, and then the biggest change in the, the transition, you mean, in the last few years, Trevor, yeah. is, yeah, that, is okay. the point of view <laughs> of our host is very, you know, it's unique to Trevor. The whole Black, show is based just say it. He's black. <laughs> I was going to say... The host became black. I was going to say biracial. They remind me every day at that office. <laughs> biracial. Biracial. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's a different... Like, when you came to the show, I think we started looking at different guests. We made a real effort to make sure that we are booking women, people of color, and they didn't have to be the biggest celebrity. It, we were taking people that might not be telling the same story on every late night show, maybe, you know, and the big stars all get on the, you know, every show they want. But what about like the third actress in a movie that isn't getting a spot on late night? Well, let's have her come here. And we started, um, I think we have the most female guests of any late night show. Yeah, I think we have three on this week, I believe. We did. Yeah. We, you know what's funny is we got to a point where we didn't count anymore. Yeah, so we that, don't count. Yeah, that was, I, mean, I wasn't counting. That, no, but, but genuine. No. That was one of the greatest gifts of the show is like, how do you create a space where you're not, you're not trying to implement tokenism, but rather true representation? You know, um, because a lot of people speak about it like it's a chore, but fundamentally for me, it's about trying to find and create a space where you are tapping into different conversations just for a competitive advantage. How do you keep the show fresh? How do you keep it interesting? So you're not just having the same authors, the same actors, the same producers, the same everything on your show. You're trying to tap into what people are doing, watching, seeing, etc. And so that's what's great about everyone. Like, like Jen will just tap me sometimes and be like, yo, as a woman, this is what I'm seeing. And genuinely, sometimes you cannot see those things as a man. You will have a blind spot. You know, sometimes you will say, hey, as a black person, this is what I see. You, you know, uh, Jubin is from Iran. He's having a great time in life right now. <laughs> um, oh, great. So like, Everything's good. when he couldn't fly yeah. home, <laughs> when he couldn't fly home or people couldn't fly to him because of the Muslim ban, I mean, like, it, it was in the office in, a, in an interesting and different way, you know? So the fact that he's the funniest person I know is, is the main part, the reason he's there, but then it became like an extra bit of texture that was like, oh, how can we talk about this on the show in a, in a different way that connects with people? It was... Uh it's, it's interesting because when, you know, uh, when, um, when the Muslim travel ban happened, I was about to get married. Um, so, you know, not to bring the... Basically, because of, you know, I had a whole bunch of aunts and uncles and cousins who were going to come to my wedding, but, but the travel ban stopped them from coming. So, Which President saved Trump you a lot of money. Saved you me $20,000, basically. You did say he that at the time. Able to invite his B-list was half You did say work. that at the time. Yeah. Tre President Trump saved me $20,000, which is very nice. <laughs> very nice. Thank you. 
David, I want to ask you, because you, you've known Trevor for a long time. You write, some of, you write most of his jokes, it sounds like, most of his jokes. Oh, every, every single joke he writes. There's some sort of weird like, AI system that's happening right now. <laughs> no, it like, no. travels through the air into to Trevor's brain, I think, is something that, that you're... Yeah, thinking. we can all see it. We can all see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you guys are thinking about writing in Trevor's voice, I mean, how, how does that work? And is, has that been a big change for the show? Well, I think at the beginning, it was like, uh, it was a huge change because I was, I mean, I've worked with Trevor for like 15 years or something. So I sort of was more, I was closer to it than the rest of the people. But at this point in time, I think everybody can write in your voice because of the work that we've done over the last four years. But it was, at the beginning, it was a real battle, especially like when he would tell, like they would write Jewish jokes that you could not say. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then we were like, this is not going to work. And, uh, you know, but now it's now. Well, I yeah. was going to ask, is there a joke that Trevor or an impression that Trevor thinks is really funny, but you guys have to kill like every day? Please don't say it. No, please. No. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. <laughs> like, like, we try and kill it every day. And we are not going to lose it now. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I, won't, I won't do it. But I won't. no, no, no. The, no but please. <laughs> please. <laughs> This is a trap. We know how Twitter is. I'll do it. I'll do it. It's not a trap. trap. We should do it. Who who thinks we should do it? No. (laughs) I won't do it. I won't do it. No, no, no. No, no, no. Let me explain. Give the context and don't do it. Let me explain. Just the context. This is what's interesting. This guy pulled up his phone. He was like, I got him. (laughs) Calm down. Put your phone down. Calm down. This thing's being live streamed anyway. So... So you're trying to end my How career. How the Daily Show ended. Yes. How the Daily Show ended. They were laughing and it went up in flames. No. So, so here's what's interesting. This is one of the hardest things to understand in and around comedy is just what David said. I got to a show that had been defined in many ways by the host's uh, background. You, you had a host who was talking about being from New Jersey. You had a host who, who made jokes about being Jewish and a lot of the writers were Jewish. And so it was a space that the, 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 the show operated in comfortably. And then I would get a script like that and I'd be like, I, can, I, can, I, can I make this joke? This feels weird. And they'd be like, oh yeah, this is fine. And then everyone would be like, oh yeah, but when you say it, no, 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 it doesn't work. <laughs> And the same goes for like, let's say accents or, or, or certain act outs or like stories that you're telling. Context changes when you change borders. And it's, it is a trial and error uh, process. You know, I tell a joke in South Africa to South Africans and everyone goes, yeah, we're on the same page. We laugh about this. You tell that same joke to Americans about South Africans and it seems like you're laughing at people as opposed to with people. And so the hardest challenge is figuring out how you can target a joke in such a way that everyone, or as many people as possible, understand what direction you're going in. So there would be some things I would do where I'd, I'd do an act. I, I like impersonating everybody. And so like we'd go through world leaders and I'd do Trump and then I'd do Obama and then I'd do another leader, another leader, another, and then I'd get to one leader and they'd be like, whoa, <laughs> we can't do that accent in America. Then I'm like, but that's, that's his accent. They're like, yeah, no, no, we just go. And then I realized it's because of America's history of racism that I'm now limited in the jokes that I can tell because we don't have that burden in South Africa because we never oppressed a certain group of people. <laughs> Who they are, I'll leave you to guess. I will, um, I, but yeah. I, I'm sorry. Oh, it's, it's fine. We've, you gave <laughs> me Trump, like so it was like a fair trade. Okay. I, I love him. I'm the representation <laughs> of America up here. What about Jen is too? Jewish. We represent America. Yes, yes definitely. Yeah. And we're women, so it's great. I think so, yes. yes. Like for the jokes, yes. Is that what you're saying? For the approval of the jokes? I think so. Is that what the question was? It's not a question. Oh, it's a statement. Then, <laughs> it was a, a statement. Then the statement, statement. yes. Just the point. statement. I'll say the great, the great thing about Trevor, too, is that he is also very... He's very good at finding the funniest version of what the joke you were trying to make. So a lot of times you'll, you'll pitch a joke and you'll say, like, oh, how about something like this? And Trevor will... He'll recognize, even if it wasn't funny what kind of comedian you are, what style of joke you tell best, and so what you really probably meant to say, and he'll say, oh, you mean like going like this? And he'll say the joke much better than the way you said it. And you'll be like, yeah, yeah, you got it. Yeah, you, you got that joke. I could use that. It, it really works. <laughs> Let's uh, talk quickly about the success of the show online. On YouTube, behind the scenes or between the scenes has become huge. How did that come to be? And did you expect that this would become as big of a thing? Um, I don't think we expected to be such a hit. I think it, it just started with, you know, Trevor in between acts of the show was telling these stories and kind of just maybe opining further on uh, events of the day. And it was very compelling. And, uh, and he said, you know, are we rolling on this? Are, we, do we, are the cameras rolling? Because they should be. We should probably just get this out. And we were like, oh, yeah, let's do it. So then we... we threw the cameras on and it was kind of a little looser vibe 
And, you know, it's just a more, uh, a looser version of what Trevor does. You know, the show, like Trevor always says, is like, jo you know, premise, joke, premise, joke. Like, you have to get through it really fast. You have a, sh a limited time. And in between the scenes, he can take his time and explore a topic a little further, kind of work out his feelings on it. Um, and you could probably speak to it further. Uh, yeah, I think, I think for me, between the scenes came about, I think, in two ways. One, I love speaking to people. So fundamentally, that's why I love stand-up. And, and it's also why I like engaging in politics. I think politics is best when it is engaged in. You know, not spoken at, not shouted at, but rather spoken about. And so what I, what I realized is every day we had 200 odd people sitting with us in a studio who were human beings. And I was like, I, I don't know everything. I'm not even trying to act like I know everything. I'm giving you my perspective on what is happening in the world. But I would like to talk to you, the people. And so I would talk to the audience. What are you watching in the news? What do you think about this story? Do you have any questions for me? Let's, let's engage in this. And it was actually an audience member who said to me one day, I bumped into them outside and they were like, hey, I... Can, do, do we, are we gonna see that anywhere? And I was like, see what? And like the conversation we had, and I was like, no, it was a conversation. And the person said, I, I would have loved to show it to my friends, or it, it was something different. And that's when I spoke to Ramin and I said, hey, is there a way you could put this out and keep it as authentic as it is? You know, don't try and overproduce it. Let's just keep it as organic as it should be. And it created a, a, a different space for the show to exist within, because I still like keeping the, sh the Daily Show as, as polished and as, as propelled as possible. But between the scenes is fundamentally an exploration of a different idea on, on social media where you do have more time. You do have a, a different space where you, can, where you can give people a vignette of what you're thinking. And as I say, it, it's not supposed to be right, it's not supposed to be wrong, it's just me ruminating and going through ideas and thoughts with an audience who's live and feels less on edge because the camera's not on them at that moment. And, and we put it out, and genuinely, I don't think anyone thought it would be as big as it is now, and, and we've... No, and I, and I was at the taping a couple of weeks ago, and I mean, I, I, I was a little bit nervous you'd call on me, even though I know that's not how it works. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's gonna call on me, but like, oh, but it, it genuinely felt like a conversation with you while right. I was sitting there. And, and you can't even really believe that that conversation that's happening there is gonna then hit the internet and have like two million views. Right, that's and been amazing, yeah. And uh, do, you, do you watch the numbers there? Do you watch the, the view count on that's, YouTube? I rely on Ramin to do that. Genuinely, well, Ramin, I, I just give. I just. I just wait. I just Trevor's go. Like, Trevor, how did that one do? <laughs> yeah. It's like good. Don't worry about it. It's good. You just give him a Facebook. Just like. one thumbs up, and he's like, great. Okay. Very no, short. Do you read the comments? Can I? Can I tell you? No, why? I don't read the comments. Okay. <laughs> Never no, read the comments, the comments on, online. No, the, the comments on between the scenes are great, but general rule of social media is that you don't read the comments. Because it's, oh, you know, things can get it. crazy. It's just <laughs> no, you, you know what I think it is, is, and that's what's great about the team, is we try and focus on what we're best at doing. So uh, Ramin's great at guiding the show and helping us grow in a digital space that The Daily Show wasn't always within. And part of his job is to alleviate my stress in that I'm not trying to create viral content. I hate it when people say that. We should make a viral thing. I'm like, that's not how it works. It becomes viral. You know, very seldom can you just create virality. You don't know what it's gonna be. And so I'm just doing me. We are creating for the show. And then Ramin is fantastic at then tailor making that or, or reconfiguring it or creating a new from that, an idea that will work organically in that space. And so that's what it is between the scenes. He doesn't say to me, don't do that, do this, whatever. He just goes like, hey man, that, that was a great piece. It connected all. I really liked what you said there. Some days I don't even think it's a thing. And Ramin's like, oh, no, no, I want to put that out. And so that's what's been great about it is I'm, I'm not, I let go when it comes to that element of the show. And, and, and I trust other people to push the show forward. And that's really what The Daily Show is, is about for me, trusting people who I believe can do it in a slightly better way than I can in the department that they're in. And I want to just quickly ask about ratings because right now you're number one amongst millennial men. Wasn't always that way. Uh, the, t the two millennial men, <laughs> really, real big support from millennial men out here. Um, you're, you're number one there, but it wasn't always that way. And you're quite successful on, on social. I mean, how do you gauge success? Is it ratings? Is it comments? Is it hearing I, things in the media? I mean, I think for us, it's like making sure we put out a show that we're proud of and having fun doing it during the day because we're there every, like, it's a long day if you're not having a good time over there. Well, it's not that long. We're having it's, fun. I'm, I'm saying if you were... <laughs> But I think that at the end of the day, like we know when it's like an okay show or when it's like, it feels like it was a great show. And usually the, um, yeah, if you can leave the day feeling like this was a great 
version of The Daily Show, we covered things that everyone's talking about or things that no one's talking about that we're interested in. Um, and so ratings, I think once you start worrying about rating, like the network will tell us when it gets real bad. You know, we'll, <laughs> we'll, he we'll hear if we're going on. That's how I think. But I think like well. not worrying about it that much and just making a show that we're proud of. But Jen, since you were here and you, you lived through the Jon Stewart transition, when do you, and no, Trevor, I'd like to answer this as well, when do you feel like it transitioned from Jon Stewart's Daily Show to the Trevor show? Trevor uh, Noah show. Yeah. I'm like, what was it? September 28th, 2015? I mean, not the exact no, date, um, but like the day that it, you felt like it was not I, in the I don't shadows of I it. think it was a little bit at a time, so I can't actually put like a time frame on it. I think it was, was in it? the end of year two, I was really like, this is Trevor's show. This is the whole staff knows the voice of the show now and where we're going with it. We were, the expansion team's doing a lot, like things that we never did on the old show. Um, and... You know, I think like there's there are great things about the John show that we keep, and then there are great things about the show now that like wouldn't have worked back then. Um, so, but I do feel like kind of like mid year two. I think for me, the moment when I noticed a difference in the in the direction we were going, a very tangible change, was when we went on the road. So when we covered the, the conventions, the Republican convention, the Democratic convention, this was a completely new experience for many of us. In fact, all of us in that we were all in a new place and we were trying to do the show in a new way. And so what that did was it removed us from the comfort of knowing how it was done and we had to figure out how to do it. You know, it was new candidates, a new story, and now we're on the road. And I remember, I mean, like we did things like I was in a, a sketch, it was a Boko Haram sketch. Dave jumped yeah. into that as well. Whenever I needed like an extra African, I'm like, yo. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did like a Boko Haram thing because I, I think it was like, was it Chris Christie who was saying like Boko Haram should thank Hillary Clinton or something like that. And so we, we, we just did new things that, you know, not many people had seen the host in a sketch like in like the, the years that maybe John, like towards the end of John's tenure. And that, I think that changed what we were doing um, a little bit. And so... To Jen's point, it has been gradual, though, and I think with any late night show, with any daily show, it is going to be a gradual, incremental change, especially when there's a legacy that was entrenched in, in the hearts of many Americans. Did, did John Stewart leave any parting advice to you and ideas about what you had to make your, the show your own? Oh, he was amazing. John gave me, like, the best advice that I couldn't understand. Um, no, because if you know John Stewart, he's one of the funniest human beings ever, one of the most profound people ever, but he, like, he doesn't, he, contrary to what people may think, he, do, he doesn't like to, like, you know, jam his opinions down people's throats. He's, he's very much in a, in a zenish kind of space. And so I remember one day he, he called me in, and, um, you know, I'd just been announced as host, and it was this crazy whirlwind. You know, and, and he, he brought me into his office and he said, um, and he, he had his, um, his shoes off and his socks. And he said to me, the shoes were on the ground. And he said, hey, uh, uh, do you want to try these on? And I was like, what? And I was like, why? And he said, what, what size are you? And I said, I'm a size 11. And then he was like, oh, no, no, then they, uh, try, try them on. And then I tried and then I was like, doesn't fit. Then he's like, yeah, so don't listen to anyone who says you, you, you can't fit into my shoes. You've got bigger shoes to create for yourself. And I was like, wow, that was fancy. <laughs> That was fancy. I was like, you, I feel like you could have told me that without the foot fungus. But I mean, it stuck with me, so well done. And then he left me with a cryptic message. I said, what is The Daily Show, John? What, like, everyone takes it seriously. What is it? And he said, The Daily Show is what the host thinks it's supposed to be. What do you That's think? That's what is? he says. Genuinely, I think it's an extension of what I think and what I communicate and how I, how I absorb the world with my friends. And so that's been a wonderful journey, is realizing... You know, when I came to The Daily Show, the first thing people said was, what does a South African know about American politics? It's totally, what are you going to do? How are you going to, you know? And it was like, well, that's a good question. I was like, I, I don't know anything. Then I realized, no, politics is fundamentally the same in most countries around the world. It's just the characters that change. You will find corruption everywhere. You will find oppression everywhere. You will find systems that are created in ways that benefit or hurt certain people everywhere. And so what I came to realize was we were telling the same story with just a different version. So it was like the British office versus the American one. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly what this is about, you know? And it jumped a thousand times forward. And I think Dave will remember when Donald Trump came in, because I'll, I'll never forget, we watched Donald Trump. Everyone else was weird. Mitch McConnell and what's going on, Paul Ryan and filibustering and all of this stuff. And then Donald Trump came on screen, started speaking, and we looked at each other like, I know this guy. 
<laughs> and we were like, this, this is Africa all over again. We're home. Yeah. <laughs> and I will say, I will say that what, he did leave you um, the cryptic message, uh, the smelly shoes, and he left a incredible <laughs> staff. I mean, the Definitely. people here were left by John Stewart, and they have been um, instrumental in taking the show to where it is now, yeah. you know, the new version of the show. So we cannot underestimate how difficult it is to, to find pearls. like. And they're thankful guys. for the dogs. Oh, definitely. And the dogs, yeah. Where would we have just found dogs randomly? <laughs> this is not as easy as people think. I mean, office trained dogs? No dogs pee in the office? No dogs poo in the office? Are we living a good life? Jen's dog is fairly new. It's a puppy. Yeah, but yeah, that, I mean, that's an exception. But Izzy's broken. pretty well trained. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're doing well. Trained in two weeks. <laughs> Very Trevor, smart. I want to ask you a couple of personal questions. We're going to turn to 2020 in the future. But one of my favorite things is your impressions and the way you impersonate people. We've done a little bit on, on stage here. And again, I want to ask if there were any, if there were one, if you, let me start with, did you always have this talent? I, I've always had the, the ability to mimic people who I get to know. You know, I, I don't do random impressions. I'm not that person. But if I get to know a person, I find over time their cadence is something that becomes apparent, and especially if they have a distinct cadence. And um, I remember when Donald Trump started, I was just like, man, I don't really, I mean, how does he sound? And then every day I would just like repeat something he says, because he says some of the funniest, craziest things. And then I would just sit there by myself and I'd be like, so many people, so many people, so many people. Because like rhythmically, he has like, like a musicality to him. And I would just like sit there, and I would find myself just like singing them like they were songs. So I'd just be like walking around the office and I'd be like, they're coming, they're coming, so many coming. We gotta build a wall, folks. Gotta build a wall, build a wall. And I would do that all the time. And then literally one day out of the blue, it like, it popped out of me as a thing. So I went from like singing it to all of a sudden, I was just like, so many, so many people. They're coming, folks. They're all here. Caravans and caravans. I would, I would listen to that podcast or some remix of that on Spotify. So that's, yeah. That's an idea for you down there. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, you like, got it. Like an ASMR. Thing. Yeah, we can talk after. <laughs> I also wanted to ask about, um, well, I've, I've been listening to your book. I've got 40 minutes left. Can, well, I asked you before, but what happens at the end? Can you? I, I live, spoiler alert. <laughs> I don't like to spoil it. I don't, you've okay. got like 30 minutes. I've got, yeah, like 40 minutes yeah, left. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you just... Okay, well, so, I mean, you're, all the stories about your mom are just, just so impactful, and she is absolutely just such a badass woman, and you've got a EP here who's an absolute badass woman, and it just seems like you're, you, you know the future. You know that women are, are already running the world. Well, I, I, I like the idea that women are running the world, but I know that it's not the truth yet, unfortunately. And so for myself, as somebody who grew up in a matriarchal society, I do find myself more comfortable in a space where I have powerful women surrounding me. You know, my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, I had so many women who were guiding the way I lived my life. So for me, and Jen knows this for a fact, like there are, t there are times when like we will just share a joke and then we'll be like, oh boys. And then like everyone else is like, they just don't laugh or they don't get it. It's like, it's a thing. I only grew up in a world of women. Like, I mean, like when it comes to clothing, like Jen and I became best friends just because of clothing. Cause I'd be like, oh my God, those shoes. And all. But that's just because that's how I was raised with my mom. I helped her pick out high heels. I helped her pick out her outfits when we were going to church or life. So there is, there is a world that I'm familiar with partly because I was forced to live with my mother and my grandmother because my father couldn't live with us. So it, it's, it's a byproduct of who I am. Um, and, and so what I do love is, you know, and Dave knows this about me, is I, I, I love finding the jokes that everyone laughs at. So when you asked previously, like, what, how do I measure our successes? Ratings is one metric, yes. Uh, a financial metric. But what I find is great for me on the show is to see how many new audiences we can reach. So for instance, The Daily Show has always been particularly popular with male millennials because, you know, that's, that's what, you know, here. The Daily Show has been. Yeah. Um, you know, because of Comedy Central, etc. But But what I've really enjoyed is seeing us growing our numbers in terms of women who are viewing the show. You know, seeing that that change takes effect because you start putting on more content and telling more jokes that aren't just for a young frat guy or a guy in college or you try and expand your, 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 you try and open your aperture a little wider, you know, and then seeing black people watch The Daily Show. Like that was one of the craziest things. I remember when I joined the show and literally my favorite thing was like black Americans would just come up to me like, hey man, you do the got that show, right? And I'll be like, yeah, do you watch? Be like, hell nah, man, I ain't got, I ain't, I ain't watching that shit. 
ain't, ain't none of that shit for me. And I was like, wait, what do you, why don't you watch the show? And he's like, hey, man, I, man, I got nothing against it. But he's like, but I, there's nothing on that show for me. And then I was like, well, well, I'm in your world, you know, like, like black Twitter is, is a Twitter that's connected all over, you know, black people in South Africa, black people in Nigeria, black people in America have had storylines and narratives that have tied us together, together in different ways, whether it's music or whether it's storytelling or whether it's just ancestry. And then I was like, well, how do I bring those stories into the show? How do, how do I create that? And I think, you know, that's where Jen has been instrumental. That's where half of our staff has been instrumental. It's having women in the building where we go, you're not just here, just as a, it's like, no, we need you. Help us figure out a thing, help us give an extra point of view, help us dissect an idea. You're talking about abortion. I have my opinions, of course, but I cannot truly understand the impact of limiting a woman's right to control her own body because I'm not a woman. And so it helps to have a building that has half of the staff being women because then you go like, hey, how do you feel about this? Allow me to be your mouthpiece, allow me to put you on the show, allow me to create a sketch where you can, you can speak your truth, but I know that I am not the arbiter of the story, nor do I wish to be. Yeah, the I wish to Desi, be an ally. The, I mean, yeah, yeah, I the wish to be an Desi's ally. What doing is, is great. Yeah, she's wonderful. And we have, um, like, anyone in the building can pitch. So there's so many different kinds of people, ages, races, genders, people of different mindsets, like liberal, conservative. We have all different types of people that work there and anyone can pitch and the best thing gets on. Um, and I think that we really take into account if a story is a story like abortion, it just so happened that the best pitch for that day came in from one of our fe female writers, Lauren, had a great pitch. Right. Um, it happened that she was a woman, it, probably because she felt really connected to it and you know, she sent out a few pitches. Um, so it was nice to be able to have a woman write on that thing. But um, this was the uh, vagina as your corporation. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, you guys yes. should all watch it. It's very funny. Yeah. It got a lot of people tweeting me, incorporate that pussy. That's what they yeah. said. <laughs> and for a second, I forgot I what that was. And I just stage, woke up to so this and I was like, I, some, I've done something very wrong or very right. <laughs> and then I realized it was Desi and Dulce yeah. you know, doing the Lauren created sketch. Yeah, and it was the kind of thing where like I texted Desi and Dulce and I'm like, hey, if you saw Lauren's pitch on pitch, they, and they were both like, that's the one we like the best too. So it, it just usually works out like that where um, we're not like, this is a woman headline, so we should get some women on it. But like there's always kind of a woman in the, you know, there's now that we've made sure to, you know, make sure the staff is as balanced as it can be right now, um, the room is in just the same one kind of person. It's usually different points of view are like can be expressed in any room, the writer's room, the rewrite room, the you know morning meeting, like we kind of- The dog room. The dog room, my office, that's yeah. what we call the dog room. Um, no, but it, it's nice that um, it doesn't feel like we're doing it just to be like, this is you know a headline about women, so let's make sure, it, it feels more organic and um, it, the people that are impassioned about different topics are usually the people it affects. So that ends up being the people that work on those projects because they have a passion for talking about it. Yeah, like when Arnold Schwarzenegger was kicked in the back by a South African. Yeah. I did not find it as funny as most of my American <laughs> colleagues. Because I was like, this made our country look bad. So I had a completely different, so that's literally what Jen, you know, that's a great example of it. Albeit very different stakes, don't get me wrong. But uh, yeah, I was but really not impressed. It was on impressed. the same show, same episode. It was on the same exact episode. same episode, yeah. yes. And, and we even have conservative voices in the, in yeah. the building. Which gets really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so when, when the president does something that is good, sometimes we, go, we overlook it and they will bring it up in a in a very trolly way, but they will still bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so we have everyone, we have everyone. It's good to have people that'll break you out of the bubble that you're, you know, you but don't want to be in an echo chamber. You mentioned South Africa, and it struck me when I went to the taping, there was, a, it, was it was a really global audience. Somebody from Sweden asked a question, you had some South Africans. I mean, have you felt that impact also on, on online, especially where you're not airing every night? Yeah, well, this is where, I, I mean, I can answer that beginning part, and I think Ramin can speak to this as well. What's been really amazing about taking The Daily Show into this future of being a digital experience that exists beyond just the linear, 
we've been to we've been able to expand the show from I think when I took over it was in uh, 70 odd countries and territories and now we're in 133 and so what was great about that is we realized that we were interacting with more people than ever before so we would initially just do American stories and then obviously as a South African I'd go guys there's some really funny shit that's happening in South Africa that's also interesting that can inform you on, on how people see politics or the world. Let's throw one of those stories in. Let's throw another one in. You know, and then someone would go, hey, Canada is one of our, our biggest markets. Let's, let's, let's get some stories from Canada in the show. And in, we, we, you know, initially, I wanted to do it all at once. And then I realized, no, you have to introduce your core audience to the story so that people get invested. So who is Justin Trudeau? You know? and, then, and then who is Theresa May? What is a Brexit? How do we begin this conversation? And what's interesting is, where we once lived in a space where we thought there was no appetite, we came to re realize that it extended our reach into the globe as a show that was commenting on everything that's happening, but from a hub that is in New York City. And we don't claim to be the experts on everything. I know every single political issue has its own nuance. You know, sometimes people don't feel like we cover it all, because people do get angry. They go, like, why didn't you say everything about everything? And I'm like, because we, we don't have the time, unfortunately. So we can just give you the nugget, but it's nice to know that maybe an American audience member who may have never known about an election that's happening in Austria or a prime minister that retained their position in Australia or, or, or Modi you know, doing really well in the Indian election, maybe, maybe they wouldn't have known about those things. It's nice to expand. And I think Ramin has seen how that can change how we interact with people. Yeah, and, and I think it also, you see the comments online on Facebook, on Twitter, and people are just so uh, thankful that you know, this content is reaching them where it wouldn't otherwise. Um, and I think for us too, like it's, it's nice to get out of the, the Trump bubble a little bit. So to find these other stories that it gives us a break because we're all consumed by it every day as we all are. It's, it's just such a part of our lives. So anything that kind of releases that valve is, is really nice for us and for our audience, I think. Well, it's a good segue to the getting out of the Trump bubble because we're gonna talk now about the future, and the future is very soon upon us in 2020, and we've got, the, we've got a lot going on in 2020 for all sorts of media, but how does, how does the Daily Show plan to step it up? What is, what is gonna look different for this season or this, this presidential election for the Daily Show than any of the other previous seasons? Well, first and foremost, we have an intensity in America's politics that I think is unparalleled. You know, I, I, I can distinctly remember different phases in the show that matched where America was in its pol uh, political conversation. When I took over The Daily Show, you know, when I was handed the reins by John, I was living in a space and I was, I was exploring a world where for all intents and purposes, things were going well. You know, and I felt like people were still trying to be outraged, but there wasn't really anything to be outraged about. Conversations were fractured, people were divided in what they were looking at and toward. And then Trump came in, took the White House, and immediately you felt like there were very distinct lines about what people were thinking about and how they were defining the country as a whole. And that gave The Daily Show the propulsion that it needed. In many ways, similar to how The Daily Show with John really took off when George Bush became president, because now you understand where the focus is and what you're trying to do. And, and so for us now, what's really exciting is the conversation and the storyline around the Democrats. You know, because people always talk about Trump, 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 but it's like, yeah, but like they are as much a story in his journey as he is in theirs. You know, the Democrats and how much they succeed or fail is going to determine the history of America, you know, uh, whether they reach out to the right people, whether they communicate in the right way, whether they step on their own dicks as they're trying to get there. <laughs> this is going to be the story that defines America. And so what's great for us now is now we're starting the journey. You know, for instance, we have a segment called World War D where we just focus on the democratic primaries and what's gonna happen in the race. We just focus on the story that's happening. And what's funny is some of our audience were shocked by that. They were like, how, how can you make a joke about Joe Biden? He's our guy. And I was like, yeah, yeah but we're still gonna tell the truth. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't, think, I don't think people that you love should be free from criticism or critique. You know, it doesn't mean that I'm now going to say that Joe Biden made this mistake and so Trump and him are the same. I'm not saying that. But I don't think I want to live in a blind world where we're not analyzing everything critically because I feel like you get to, the, you know, you get to a big debate and then people are like, why didn't we notice that? And so for the show, what's exciting now 
is for, for us to be on a journey where we're going, how do we tell those additional stories, as Ramin is saying? How do, we, how do we get the Daily Show geared up for this 2020 challenge that is first going to be just Democrats amongst themselves. Trump is watching the, the, the Royal Rumble with popcorn, having a great time. He's getting ready for his bout, but we're telling that story. We're getting ready to follow the journey of each of these candidates as they narrow the field down from 112 to three or two, <laughs> and then maybe one. And then it's, it's going to be how do you now cover the story in a way that is still authentically satirical, funny, because I believe that jokes are what propel our show. I'm not gonna stop telling jokes because things get serious. That's how we get through the seriousness. But then at the same time, what we're trying to do more than anything is remember what mistakes people made in the previous election, whether it's ourselves, whether it's the media, whether, we, you know, whether it's news organizations, uh, you know, politicians or, 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 or voters themselves, and remind ourselves so that we're not doing the same thing and repeating the same story. And that's what's exciting for us, is, is, is thinking about how we're getting to that next place. You and know, how are you? I mean, Jubin, what, what are you, you going to do? What's going to be different what about this, of our, about your coverage? Well, we'll be going to the conventions uh, okay. in 2020, which I think will be, I think, the sixth time the show has actually gone on the road to go to the conventions, which is, it's great to be... It's great to put sort of like a put our presence there. We can get all our correspondence out there into the mix, being on the scene and um, and really just making people say great stupid things. And I think that's on I, both I, sides. On both sides, yeah. I, I think I think the the great thing about the um, the best thing uh, and the worst thing about America is that every two years. We spend two years talking about everything in the context of the presidential campaign. So, you know, wh whether it's a, a, a nuclear bomb goes off in a city, the immediate first question would be like, how will this affect 2020? And everything gets discussed through that lens. So that intensity naturally builds anyway in the country. And it's, I think, the bigger challenge for us is not, is not how to ride that intensity because it comes at you like a tidal wave. It's more how do you absorb it and comment on it um, without getting so um, locked into the day by day that you end up thinking kind of what a lot of people did in 2016, which is like, wow, every day this Trump guy goes out and makes an asshole of himself. Hillary, is in, this is in the bag for Hillary, you know? And that is, I think, what the challenge will be for both the um, political world and also us to keep that kind of perspective going in. So I want to throw this, I'm going to get you guys all involved here. So I want to see if we can bring the magic of the show uh, and what may happen in, in 2020 to the stage. See if we can... Happened in 2020? Or? What we're going to, what, I'm, going to, I'm going to predict the future. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And, future and, of everything. So I was just like, wait, exercise. are we done? So I'm going to predict wait. the future in a headline. I want to see how we all kind of, you guys all come together and create what might be whatever ends up on the show. Wow. <laughs> Are Basically, you you're asking KFC for their 11 herbs and spices right now. <laughs> That's what you're doing. Yeah, you're asking no, Coca-Cola for us. the secrets. No one's here. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> We're going to be good. I'm just going to lie, but ask your question. Okay. So here's the headline, and you guys are going to... Well, I don't know. Everyone knows what you do now. I don't, I don't really still understand what everyone does here. Okay, so the headline is, Bernie takes Iowa. Bernie takes, where does he take it to? Is this physically or just, you're talking about the results? The I'm results, just making sure. We live in a crazy fruit Iowa future. Someplace. You never know. Bernie he might just be like, I'm done with, I'm taking you with me to Vermont. And then we're now in Vermont. <laughs> and then the headline would be like, I'll be like, oh my God, guys, I didn't know a senator could physically take a place. <laughs> Apparently there's like a loophole in your constitution where this can happen. And then we would sit discussing and I'll be like, did, did you guys know this it? as Americans? Did, did you know that Bernie uh, could no, take, it, it did you know that a senator like could take a place? Road trip movie or something like it's. Yeah, and then we would <laughs> we'd start discussing this about taking a place. And then Dave, you would say, guys, we need to calm down and be positive. <laughs> Right, and then I would go, damn, I can't believe that Bernie took Iowa to Vermont. And then I go like, Jubin, man, you know what would be funny is if he took it somewhere else. Like, wouldn't it have been funny if Bernie took it to... Man, whatever you're going to say next is great, Trevor. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> We're in. <laughs> and then I feel like Ramin would run into the room and he'd be like, yo, did you see that Iowa is missing? It's blowing up online. And then I'd be like, yeah, Ramin, we're going to do it on the show. What do you think we could do to cover this online, Ramin? I think we should do social media stuff. I think we should, like, you know, we should, like, come up with some tweets. 
and we should get them out, and it's going to be great. It's going to be great. What do you right. think? I mean, we talked about it. you got to do memes. TikTok. Like we'll do, do me. TikTok. We'll do TikToks. We'll do like yeah, it'll be awesome. That's what we would do. And then I would look to Jen, and I'll say, Jen, which Genius correspondence stuff. do we have? Who can we get to where Iowa was before? Who can we get to Vermont to see how Iowa is dealing with being taken by someone from Vermont and the fact that they're there? Are Iowans screwed over by this or Vermont? And then we get there, and we realize that everyone's happy because the populace of both places could fit in one space. And so now we realize that it wasn't that bad after all. And then Bernie's like an emperor or something. And then he just starts a new thing in America. And then Trump's losing his shit. And he's like, where's Iowa? They're gone. Stolen away, communism, folks. The worst. So much worse. And then Bernie's got his thing on that side. And then we tune into Fox. And then Janine is like, he did a great job. Our great leader fought against Bernie. And he will kill him down. And then CNN will bring seven people on to shout at each other. What do you think? What do you think? I hate you. I hate you. And then we'll come back on. And then we'll be like, all right, guys. So now there are only 49 states. Let's see what happens in the rest of the election. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> but then Jen kills it all. Why would Jen kill it all? Jen kills it all. She says we're not going with this. No, no, no. Why would Jen do Jen? Let me tell you, one thing I love about Jen is Jen is the how do we make this happen person. And I'm a good audience. I laugh at all. Yes, Jen is like crazy. (laughs) Jen goes, if I go, let's blow something up, she'll be like, all right, how much explosives? (laughs) Jen makes everything happen at the show, whether it's a balloon dropping or a library being built. That's like our propulsion. I tell you, she's my genie. I just go like, yo, Jen. I always ask her, I go like, can you do this on American TV? And then she'd uh, be like, we'll yeah, find out. Well, let's, oh, let's do it. Try. Like one day I was like, can we, can we like burn something in the studio? I was like, if, if only we could. And Jen was like, we can do that. We can make fire pop out of the desk. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then like today I was like, man, it would be cool if I had an Oreo too. She's like, we can get you an Oreo. And I was like, what? I know. We have Mind a whole blowing. team to get Oreos. <laughs> Uh, Jen, I asked you this actually about the other day. Are you worried that if um, Trump, leave, Trump leaves the White House, there will be no, you, you will be out of material? No, not at all. Because I mean, you're. I mean, first of all, the Trump material starts to get repetitive, right? So he's not going anywhere. But he, he might not go anywhere. I mean, He'll still be on Twitter. No, 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 it like, doesn't mean we, the White House. I know we, what he means. Yeah. We um, people got really sad. Sorry, yeah. Jen. Carry on. I know. I'll explain no, what no, means. No, he's be, never getting out of the Jen, Jen, he's, he's carry never on. Leaving sorry. the conversation, like ever. But um, no, if he get if the Democrats take the 2020 election, we'll like make jokes about that too. We did. Obama was the co- coolest president you can have. It's hard to make jokes about, but we did it for eight years at the Daily Show. So I I am not scared at all that if he is not president anymore, that this show will be affected. We'll start talking about the Congress, the Senate. We lost. I mean, the last few years, like I don't think we've talked that much about any of the major players yeah. in Congress or Senate because he's sucking the oxygen out of everything. But we, you know, we used to talk about McConnell all the time, Paul Ryan, Boehner. I mean, our audience would know a lot more about that branch of government, but right now it's all executive. I would, I would say with two things. Uh, I'll give you an example. Today was a great example of the sh- on the show. You had um, Ben Carson at a hearing, right? the uh, HUD secretary. And as many people know, Ben Carson does not know much about housing, right? (laughs) Brilliant brain surgeon, very bad at housing, right? And so he was being asked questions and he failed to understand what one of the questions was. That's where the REO thing came from. They said to him, are you familiar with REOs? And he was like, REOs? And they were like, no, REOs. And he's like, REOs? And they're like, do you know what REO stands for? And he was like, real estate? And they're like, and the O? And he was like, organization? And they're like, no, no, ownership, no. And, and so like that, that's one of those moments. And I said it to the audience today. I said, man, you forget because of Trump how many other people are involved in running America that are really crazy people that you could put a spotlight on. And so I think those people would always be there. You know? And secondly, to what Ramin was saying, I always say, I go like, yo, this is Trump when he has to report to the White House. Listen to how he complains when he's won. Now, imagine if that guy, you guys think that guy would lose an election and then just be like, all right, I'm going home. (laughs) No, we will see him every day 
24 he will be on every fuck if he doesn't start his own network I Ra- would be rallies are his favorite thing he's yeah. just doing rallies just now and like yes. focus grouping nicknames for yes. candidates it like, would be it would he would get to do what he's doing now without having to act like he's at work there's all, there's also the thing of like who would come in true because if bernie came in then oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> No, there's jokes for... De- there's certain people who have, like, a lot more character about them. Like, Bernie's one of those. And what's great is, you know, like, Bernie... Like, a lot of his fans, for instance, they hate it when we joke about him on the show. But Bernie laughed with me on the show. Like, that's I'd what's great about Bernie. Show, yeah. yeah, Bernie's, like... He doesn't take himself completely seriously. He's doing a serious thing, but he's still a human being. So he can laugh with me, you know? He, like... And that's that's what's great about the characters that are in the race. Is like, you can still make jokes about Joe Biden. You can still tell jokes about Bernie, uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, Kamala Harris. Regardless of who would take the White House, I think we would have enough material to grow with them as a character. It's just, as you said now, Trump has sucked out the oxygen, so it's hard to learn anyone's story when that story is the predominant one. And right. the one good thing that Trump has done is that he has made pe- people politically engaged. Definitely. So I think that uh, there was a bit of a lull when everybody thought things were going well. And uh, now, if Trump leaves, people hopefully will still be politically engaged, otherwise the new Trump will come and then remind them. Trump 2.0. Oh, oh geez. <laughs> yeah, it'll be like an even worse version of Trump. Yeah, this is the scary part of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask a little bit about the reach that you guys have, especially in the 2020 election with more people focused on politics than it, you, you inform a big part of the electorate. More people may watch your Bernie impression than they actually see of Bernie on the news or of, of, of his stances. Do you worry about that? What, is, what do you think your responsibility is knowing that? I think of it as an opportunity as opposed to an obligation. You know, um, one, of, one of the best comedians I ever had the pleasure of speaking to was Dick Gregory, and, and I asked him how he created the jokes he did and why he was so successful, and he said to me, he said, young man, if you, if you go looking around for, for jokes, you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna chase your tail. But he said, but if you, if you look for the truth, you're gonna find things funnier than you can ever imagine. And I, that stuck with me. I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's all I need to do is find the truth, and then I can, tell, I can tell the jokes. And so for me, what I try and do on the show, and we try and do this is, I, I specifically want The Daily Show to be a place and a space where you can escape the idea that the world is ending. I wish to provide comedic catharsis because that's what I love. If I didn't laugh, my family didn't laugh, my country didn't laugh, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. We've had to use humor to heal our wounds. And so that's what I like to do on the show, is create a space where we can do that. And I do the same thing and we do the same thing when we talk about what's happening. We go, yes, there's a joke, but then we try and slip in the important parts of what you need to know. We also try and strip away all the noise. Because America, whether it's the news or politicians, is really good at adding superfluous statements and words and phrases that nobody really understands, but just makes people look cool. You know, but it's like, no, just, just tell me the basics of what I need to know. Right, all you need to know right now is that America's in a trade war with China. All you need to know right now is that additional tariffs have been imposed. That's what you need to know right now. It's gonna raise the prices of American goods and China maybe can afford to, to suffer a little bit more because their people don't have as much of a say. That's all you need to know right now. I don't need to take you into the macroeconomics of what's going on. I just need you to follow the story. And we do the same in politics, but the jokes is what keeps us going forward. The jokes is what separates us from the Wall Street Journal, is our ability to say, no, here's the humor for what you know. If it's the only thing you watch, I'm not completely happy about that because I would like you to know about the news when you watch The Daily Show, but I do create it so that if it is your only exploration into the news, you're not walking away not knowing what's going on. And so with, when I do a Bernie impression, I'm doing it in the context of what Bernie is doing and how he's doing it. You know, today we covered Bernie Sanders going on Fox News. And yes, I did a joke about Bernie Sanders, but I also commented on how he had an interesting take on how you can speak to people who are in a place or in a space that is opposing to yours, but you believe so much in your, in your, in your platform and your ideas that you know you can win them over. And he did well at his town hall, and we spoke about that. Same thing with Pete Buttigieg. We joke about him, we joke about how he looks, you know, with his cute little face. And so, <laughs> but then we also talk about his policy and how he engages in a different way in a space that most people would consider um, a space of, of adversaries. And, and so that's what I'm trying to do. I think I have less chance of you, if you're not gonna watch Bernie's policy speech, then you won't watch me talking about his policy speech, but you will watch me telling a joke about his policy speech that may engage you in his policy speech because you want to see what he said versus what I said, and then I feel like I've contributed in some way to how you engage with the news that informs how you ultimately should vote. Very good answer. 
I had a bunch of follow-ups, but don't have another one. We're going to go to audience Q&A in a couple of minutes, um, but so think about your questions. There'll be mic runners running around someplace out there. But I have two, two more forward-looking questions for you all. Uh, well, we'll, do the, we'll do the first one as a group, so we'll do our five words thing again, but you don't have to actually say five words. In 10 years from now, Trevor's probably got gray hair. Baron Trump might uh. be president, I'm not sure. Uh, what, what, what the future holds, but what, what, are, what do you think each of you, how has your job changed? What are each of you doing every day when you come to work in 10 years? I'll, I'll start by saying this. I don't know that I will be here in 10 years because I don't take for granted that I will be here tomorrow. So I try and work within a space where I'm thinking of it as the daily show. Yes, I have an idea of where I would like the show to go, but I think to what Jubin was saying earlier, there is a propensity for American news and politics to focus so far on what's at the top that it doesn't look at what's happening right here. And so in many ways, I mean, that's what Hillary did in her campaign. She looked at the White House and forgot to look at Wisconsin. And so what I'm trying to do on the show is exist in a space where I'm really looking at the day-to-dayness of it all. So to what David was saying about our conservative writers and people who work on the show, I do watch what Trump is saying and listen to how he's connecting with people because you may want to act like it's not happening, but he does know how to connect. And so I try and listen to that message on a daily basis because if I spend too much time looking 10 years ahead, then I'll miss what's going to happen today and I'll, I won't cover what's going to happen tomorrow. And so for me, that's, that's what I'm doing genuinely is I just go, what happened yesterday? How can we improve on it? And that's what we do after every single show. We sit down and we go, man, we could have done that better. That was great. That was wonderful. Let's improve on that. Let's expand on that idea. And for myself, I would be lying to you if I said anything to you about 10 years, five years, two years even. I, I, I genuinely don't know. I also don't assume that we will be alive, okay? I don't know. You don't know what's going to happen with Iran. You don't know what's going to happen with Kim Jong-un. You don't, like, you genuinely... The robots, we, this is the future of everything. Right, we, we, we assume. a lot of robots. But there. I don't think anyone knew in America that, that I don't think anyone knew that you were going to go to war with Iraq. I think, you know what I mean? Things like that just happen. And so I, I try to be careful of planning everything as if everything is not going to happen to us. What I like to specialize in is feeling, thinking, reacting, and basing our opinions on the information that we have at hand. And so that's what I hope to be still doing in 10 years in some way, shape, or form. We're going to need to change the name of this conference. Uh, do you have any thoughts? Um, I only think in 10-year gaps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Yes. Whew. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to, I'm about to steal Ramin's answer, which is, uh, do, do you want to give it or should I? Uh, you, what? Uh, you do it. Oh, yeah, well, you, You're I, in his head. You know what he's going to say? No, That's I mean. That's his special skill. No, I, yeah. I think that uh, I'll be involved in comedy in some way or form. Hopefully it'll be a daily show or wherever, like uh, my part takes me. But um, I think that we, comedies, people always, will always need to laugh. And so we will find something to laugh about in 10 years' time if we're alive. And, uh, you know, it could be like that, you know, global warming has hit us, then we'll make jokes about, oh, remember when there was land? <laughs> you know, you know, like... <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I think in 10 years' time, I'll, I'll be involved in providing this service of jokes. You'll be in the if, middle of Iowa. Yeah. If, yeah, if, telling if, that joke. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes, if the... Uh, if the, Gone. if the business will have me. I like that answer better. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, I am a very like live in the moment person. So I, and because the show happens every day, it kind of do, like doesn't give you time to think about what's going to happen. I, I don't like to plan that far in advance in my own personal life, but in the daily show, um, I would say that there's constantly new platforms that we're going to be, um, that are in 10 years, who knows where TV will be? Will there be TV? Is it's it all be streaming? In our is eye. It, yeah, I mean, I think streaming will be old by then, you know? So um, I do think, like Kabuka said, um, comedy will need to exist wherever that is, whatever platform that is. Um, I hope to be working in it. But, you know, I don't know what it'll be, obviously. I don't know. I'll probably start a podcast or something. I hear that's. <laughs> Seems In 10 years? Trendy. Yeah, it seems kind of cool. I'll probably have one. <laughs> Say a newspaper. You start a newspaper. Yeah, we're going to go back. We're going to go the other way. Yeah, we're going yeah. back. Um, 
I mean, I, you know, Trevor is going to evolve as a host and as a person. And I think my job is just to, to translate his voice to an audience on whichever platform we're existing, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, TikTok. We need to have a conversation about TikTok. Yeah. I'm here for you. It's I'm like, a, no, you. Trevor, like it's a, it's oh. a thing now and we have to like do it. So. Ramin does this all the time. He just comes and tells me about a new thing. Yeah, I'm like, and Trevor. I don't take him seriously half because he lies about some of them. So one time yeah. he told me there's a thing. He said, we need, we need something for smish smash. And then I was like, all right, let's do it. And then I was just waiting in a room and then I was like, what is, what is Smish Mash? And then he's like, no, it's now, it's happening. And then I was like, what? And then nothing happened. April Fool's. So even bang. now when he says TikTok, just because you said it, I believe it, but yeah. Yeah, it was huge. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think that's, that's, that's the job, that's the role. So we'll, I, beyond that, I have no idea. Well, my last question was gonna be for you, Trevor, which you already answered, but John Stewart did this show for 16 years. Yes at this pace and all that you guys do in terms of digital and uh, the TikToks you're gonna be doing in the future and the TV show, I mean, do you think you could do this for 16 years? Well, I, let me, I, I mean, will, you obviously don't even I think I plan to tomorrow. be on the show as long as Ellen is on hers. You know, she, she gives me the joy that I need and then I use that joy to propel my show and so it's like a day-night synergy that I have going on. And so Ellen just signed for three more years right today and so then I was like well then I'm definitely going to be staying and then I just match myself by what Ellen is doing <laughs> and then and then I, I, I should be good but but genuinely like I, I genuinely think it's a, it's a powerful place to be in yes you should plan for the future but if I look at 2016 as an anecdotal story Donald Trump one thing that he re did really well because he didn't believe maybe is that he didn't plan he just focused on each rally and each event he focused on each person and on each day and I guess a lot of the establishment politicians thought in broad strides about what was going to happen because it had always happened. And I think sometimes the trap we fall into as human beings is that we use patterns to define the future when in fact the future is defined by the now. And so when it comes to technology, when it comes to how we're sharing content, how we're communicating with each other as human beings, there is no defined path that that's going to take. You know, who would have called Microsoft starting out, who would have said that that's going to become the global giant that would connect, what, six billion people or whatever it is on different platforms between WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook? Who would have said that, that they would become one of the most powerful entities in the world? I don't think anybody could have seen that. And so I think if, you, if you're not careful, you forget that genuinely the future is happening right now on a, on a very simple level. And then what people do is they create ideas or platforms that connect to the now idea that then becomes ubiquitous. You know, So Uber was, is doing what people were doing in some way. People were giving people rides. They formalized it. They created a now thing that then took us into the future. Airbnb, people were sharing people's houses and then they moved us into the future. And so... You know, Tinder, we were doing that in real life. Uh-uh, yes, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh yeah, uh-uh, yeah. And then they just made it future. And so I think sometimes we forget that, like, that's really what the future is in many ways. It's an extension and maybe a simplification or an improvement on what we're doing right now. And so for me, if we focus on the right now, I think the future becomes apparent. Between the scenes was us embracing what we had now to create a future piece of The Daily Show. You know, um, the, the Donald J. Trump presidential Twitter library was us embracing him now in the moment, saying to ourselves, if he only communicates in tweets, what will his presidential library one day look like? And that helped us create what we believed would be a future, and we created a physical representation of, of, of a joke that, you know, that, that we manifested. And, and so that's how I like to think of it. And I think it is good that we do live in different times because that's what propels The Daily Show um, into the future, d determined by the now. Okay, we, we can keep the name of the conference. You can <laughs> keep it. Advice. You can keep we it. We can keep it. Okay, we can go to probably two audience questions. I feel bad I made the promise, but now I'm running out of time. We've got one right over here. We won't be taking questions from young millennials. Males. Oh, oh, oh okay. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's why I've called uh, on you. Female, Thank female you so much. millennial, it um, seems. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Jadan. Um, so my question's actually not for you, Trevor. I'm sorry. Oh, great. Um, and if my Off voice is shaking, I'm sorry. I'm shivering out here. Um, Jen, um, you've been in you've been in the space for so long. How have you know when you look at some jokes that people were making in the past? A lot of it was at the expense of women. Um, you know, making jokes like, oh, like what. Okay, I don't want to even want to, but no, do you, know, you know what I'm saying. Um, how have you seen this space change, and how have you, as, as a woman in such a position of power in the comedy world now, how do you use that, and how do you empower other women, and how, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Um, I, yeah, it, it has changed tremendously, and not just for women, but for, like, if you look at 20 years ago, what The Daily Show was doing, you, I cringe, you know? Like, there are things that we said and did on the show that at the time were totally fine, were whatever totally fine was, but, um, but it, certainly not anymore. Um, I think that the better question is, like, what do I do with the women that work with me? And I, I'm like, I can get you in the rooms. Like, get in the rooms, I need you to talk and encouraging women. I mean, it really is a collaborative environment, and it, I mean, we throw out good and bad jokes all the time, good and bad ideas, and I think once, and I try and remind the women that work with me that these guys throw out bad jokes all the time. <laughs> you do it too, come on. Um, so I, th I think just reminding the women, because I think women are brought up, and they say that this is like, with elementary school kids, you can see it. If a teacher asks a question, guy raises, guy will just shout out, like a boy will just blurt out whatever they think. The girl sits there and waits until she thinks it is the exact, she knows it's the right answer. And most girls will not answer a question unless they know it's right. So sitting in a, so comedy and late night is a hard space because it is about blurting things out. Um, and it is about just like saying the first thing that comes to your mind because that's not necessarily what's going to end up on the air, but like, let's have that conversation. And I think that, so I think that comedy and late night was a hard space for women because they're brought up to wait for the perfect answer. And in those rooms, there isn't a perfect answer. Um, and so trying to, imp personally, trying to impart that to the women that work with me, you know, that's, I can only, you know, do so much for women in TV, but I like, at least try and encourage the women that work with me at the show to speak up when they're in the room because we can get you in the room, like get in the room, but I need you to talk. And I think shaking that thing that you know from when you were in third grade and like waiting for that moment that you know the exact right answer, it's a really hard thing to shake, myself included. Um, so yeah, is that yeah. the answer? Okay. Great answer. And, and not to mansplain, but... Uh, <laughs> no, no, do it, do it. But, but the other part that Jen does is she whips us into shape as well, getting oh, yeah. us guys to understand, you know, like how to, you know, not, it's not about respecting women, but how to understand the women's point of view as well to get us to listen and to, you know, be receptive to that. It's not, she helps us. She teaches us a lot as well. You know, too many dick jokes sometimes. And yeah. I say, <laughs> yeah. guys, I laugh at the really good ones, but we can't just put any dick jokes on the show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it must be really funny if you have one, right? Mm. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not laughing over here, so. Uh. We think we've got time for one more. Um, hi, Someone's my name's Walker. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name's Walker Brown Adams. Um, I was wondering, you know, you touched on this a little about the fact that some people, this is an informational and almost educational experience for them because they're not watching other news outlets or they're not reading these stories. How do you kind of handle the responsibility of knowing that for some people you might really be affecting change in their viewpoints and affecting change on a larger scale? Well, I think that question is answered by a culmination of everything and everyone on the stage as an extension of the show. Um, every time we engage in a story, we're thinking of who the story affects how they process that information and what it may mean to them. Whether it's politics, whether it's social justice, whether it's economics, whatever it is in the world, we try and think of it from that point of view. And so for me, the honesty in that is best explored by people who are most affected by it. Um, and so when, when, we, when, we're doing, when we're telling a joke or when we're telling a story, all I'm trying to do is get to the most genuine space of what, what that story or what that joke should be about. And so Jen was just alluding to it now. It genuinely is. Like, I mean, as guys, we very seldom think there are too many dick jokes in any conversation. I laugh at all that's, of them. Yeah, Everyone. because that's the world we've grown up in, in many times, uh, in many instances, you know. Um, you, you may find that a white person may not be as cognizant of how ostracized a black person may feel, especially in America. And it's interesting to have that conversation. You know, how do you tackle conversations around, in, around international affairs, et cetera. And, that, and that's what we're always trying to do. And so... What I find is if you start sans joke, you just go, what is happening? 
How do you feel? How do you process this in an honest way? I find that because the formula for comedy, in my opinion, is comedy equals tragedy plus time. You know, I didn't invent that, but that's what I truly believe it is. Comedy is tragedy plus time. We try and exist in the space where we, we acknowledge whatever tragedy it may be, large or small. We, we, we take the time to process that information and then hopefully we get to the comedy once we've had a little bit of, of, of time to, to feel. And, and so when someone's watching the show, I hope that those elements come through. I hope that they go, oh, we see what happened, the truth of it, we understand how you feel about it, and then we get why you're making the joke because this is what the show is about. It's not that you dismiss it, it's not that you don't take it seriously, it's not that you don't care, it's rather that this is your coping mechanism. And that's how I work to bring people in, that's how we work on the show. I mean, we make jokes with each other all day, we fight, we laugh, we love each other. It's, it's truly a family that we exist in every day, and we try and, 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 and broadcast that to the audience that's watching every single day. That's a great, great way to end things. Thank you all so much for being here.